Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Sarah Park McLaughlin, author of four nonfiction books, who taught freshman English at Texas Tech University for 34 years. Her book, Meeting God in Silence, was later translated into Korean and published in Seoul. She's a former award-winning newspaper columnist who has published numerous scholarly articles about C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, and her original theory of humor. With Sarah Park McLaughlin, we go inside the pages of Praying with St. Augustine, published by Sophia Institute Press. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for inviting me, Chris. I'm excited. Not any more excited than I am to have this wonderful book, Praying with St. Augustine. It is something that I think is so long overdue. I'm so glad that you compiled all these wonderful prayers of this incredible doctor of the church. Well, thank you. It really was a labor of love. I started in the 90s collecting them old school, just looking through the Fathers of the Church books. And it was so much fun to have a mission like that. And then it got rejected quite a few times and I kind of put it aside. So I know it's God's timing that it was accepted by Sophia Institute Press. And now we have Praying with St. Augustine. We can take with us to Eucharistic adoration or just uplift our spirits reading it at home. Rejected? I can't even imagine that, Sarah, because this is so phenomenal. I just love it. I will tell you the only reason was people said that they thought only people would be interested in a collection of prayers by many great saints. They couldn't really imagine that somebody would want a book with just St. Augustine, but they didn't know what they were missing. I mean, he's he's phenomenal. And these prayers are not ones that people accidentally run across very often. You have to really dig through his sermons to find the gems. I love what you did. I think what makes this so lovely is that not only did you just go through and read the sermons, you were listening. You were listening to St. Augustine, and you could hear his prayers jump off those pages, didn't you? I really did. I mean, I think that's what makes him so amazing. If somebody looked at this and didn't know who he was or when he lived, they just thumbed through it. They would never guess this is somebody from the 4th and 5th century. Because with the modernized language, referring to God as you, he's just as fresh today as if he lived 10 years ago. But you're right, we can all kind of identify with his struggles and his cries to God to make him pure, to have mercy on him. Even though that he was a great saint, he never lost that sense of humility. And so he's not just a plaster saint on a shelf. He's a real person who, who struggled and who we can identify with his prayers to God. Well, he sounds like a good friend to <laughs> you. He's been very instrumental in my life. It's funny, at many different crossroads, I bumped into St. Augustine. And what really gave me the idea for the book was I went to a silent retreat and some nuns were reading these prayers during the chapel services. I'd never heard, but they were so eloquent. And um, they started out things like, oh, banquet of love. And so afterwards, I asked, where are those prayers from? And they said, they're St. Augustine. And so, but they didn't have a book. They just had some notes. So I thought, oh, okay, when I get home, I'll order prayers of St. Augustine. And I was flabbergasted back then. And still, you know, there's no real compilation. There have been some books in the past that kind of come and go that are small, like devotional books. And so I, I couldn't believe it. And I knew that I really felt like God and maybe St. Augustine was directing me to follow that lead and compile the prayers. I love the fact that you got Dr. Peter Craved to do the foreword for the book because he's written a little bit on St. Augustine. He, he knows him. He is a wonderful person. I was fortunate to meet him at an academic conference one time. He's been so helpful because I wrote to him when I was working on the book and even sent the draft to him and he commented on some of the prayers. And I ask if he would do the forward, and he graciously did. You know, one of the funny lines in there, he says there should be a warning label on the book that if you read these prayers and you don't have the luxury of academic distance, 
that the publisher is not responsible for what may happen to you. God is. And I think that's a terrific line because really, when you read these prayers, you get goosebumps. It's reading and praying at the same time. Oh, I think it's so enlightening that he would write that because this is an experience of the heart. This is a a divine communication, as it were, God speaking into this man's soul and him responding with this incredible prayer. I think you captured it beautifully. Is it okay if I read one of my favorites? Please do. You read away. Read away. Well, this one, I think, may ring a bell with, I mean, many people don't know much about St. Augustine other than they may have heard, hearts, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless till they rest in you. Some people may recognize this, though. Too late did I love you, O fairness so ancient and yet so new. Too late did I love you, for behold, you were within and I without, and there did I seek you. I, unlovely, rushed heedlessly among the things of beauty you made. You were with me, but I was not with you. Those things kept me far from you, unless they were in you, were not. You called and cried aloud and forced open my deafness. You gleamed and shined and chased away my blindness. You exhaled sweet perfumes, and I drew in my breath and panted after you. I tasted and hungered and thirst. You touched me, and I burned for your peace. Now imagine 154 pages of those type of prayers. Oh, it's just fantastic. They're all gorgeous and they're unique. He has prayers that are strictly praise. And I, it was interesting because recently I read a quote from Pope Francis in an interview who said, Mary praises God while we Christians so often forget the prayer of praise and the prayer of adoration. And so it's a lot of fun. I subdivided the prayers into groups. And one of my favorite sections is the prayers of praise, just pure praise, because I think, of course, there's prayers of petition and some prayers for forgiveness, salvation, some prayers that kind of reveal God's attributes, including the incarnate Christ. But I think that a lot of us can use the models for prayers that are just pure praise, and they're they're really eloquent, and praying with St. Augustine really does draw you closer to God. I think so, too. I think. It's because of his compelling witness, his life story, his conversion story, that he has become so relevant throughout so many centuries. I think of other great saints that have been touched by him. I know even St. Teresa of Avila looked at the confessions of St. Augustine and, and saw something that just really penetrated her heart. And I think that's so true. I mean, but for somebody out there, Sarah, who doesn't know St. Augustine, How would you put his life into context? As you said, you know, he had a dramatic conversion. He was not a believer in his youth. He was, of course, brilliant and precocious. And when he went out, his mother prayed for him, St. Monica, in the wings for many, many years. She's a real icon of the faith. But when he went off to university, he did want to pursue wisdom. But along the way, he was kind of rebellious and he had a mistress and he fell into some different sins. And he always kind of longed for truth. So God honors that. And when he was in his 30s, he had a profound conversion where the Lord just touched his heart. And boy, from then on, he was a ball of fire. He wanted to be a monk. He became a priest. They wanted him to be a bishop. He kind of reluctantly did. He lived in North Africa. And so he did become a bishop. And he wrote literally five million words that we still have preserved today. And like I said, people may think St. Augustine sounds kind of highbrow. Some of his writings are, but these prayers are not. You don't have to have any prerequisite knowledge of him other than to know that he loved God to really get a lot out of these prayers. The thing about St. Augustine is that when he became the Bishop of Carthage, journeyed with his people. He was right there in the thick of not only of their suffering, and because that particular area, it would become under terrible Roman attack. Ultimately, he saw the destruction, didn't he? I mean, he was right there in the thick of uh, their everyday lives. He was. He, he saw the suffering, and he also did a lot of work fighting the heretics. I mean, the Catholic Church has so much gratitude to St. Augustine, And that wasn't easy. I mean, a lot of doctrines back then kind of threatened the truth of the Catholic Church. And so he really stood up for the truth. And 
He had a profound effect on the church's understanding of the Trinity, for example. He wrote a piece called De Trinitate, and some of his prayers are fantastic because he talks about, he just speaks to God directly and says, Lord, help me understand, what am I supposed to tell people? How could you be up there and down here at the same time? I mean, they're just so, they're so frank. He has such an intimate relationship with God that he just spoke to him. And I think that really gives me goosebumps and kind of encourages me to just open up my heart and just tell God, you know, hey, look at what's going on in the world right now. What are we supposed to say? Give me wisdom. I think that's the key and the beauty to enter into prayer by praying with St. Augustine, by entering into his particular devotion or whatever arena that might be, whatever area he's praying into, whether it's Thanksgiving or if it's in his, in suffering or whatever that might be, it helps train us, doesn't it? That it, ultimately it will, it will find our own words after allowing St. Augustine to pray with us in his. I think so. I mean, one of the things that uh, praying with St. Augustine will show you I included a letter he wrote to a woman named Probus, a very famous letter, and she asked, you know, how to pray. And so he's given her all these tips on how to pray. He covers what Jesus, three most important things Jesus taught us about prayer. So praying with St. Augustine is a real guide to prayer on many, many levels. It's, it's inspirational to see what he had to say and the struggles and prayers, what he asked for, wisdom, humility truth, strength, forgiveness. He prayed for God to enlighten his darkness. Fill my mouth and heart and all my bones with your praise. Let my soul praise you that it may love you. Cramped is the dwelling of my soul. Expand it that you may enter in. It is in ruins. Restore it. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely. I think that's one of the reasons why, and not only for men, but for women, he has this universality about him, doesn't he? That just everybody can identify with his quest to be known to God and to know God. I guess it's that relationship to know and to be known. I think uh, you're absolutely right, Chris. And of course, a lot of people identify with his mother, St. Monica, who we have to thank for her steadfast prayer. Many people who have family members who've left the church and they're praying for them to return, and St. Monica never gave up. And look what her prayers produced. One of the greatest church fathers. It gives us a reason to think that we too can pray and pray and pray and never give up because we don't know, we have no idea the far-reaching effects of our prayers. Look at St. Augustine, for example. I mean, I bet he had no idea that he would be this influential this many years after his death. He was very humble. I really enjoy your commentaries, too, in the very beginnings of each of these different sections of prayer, That those different times that, in how do I want to say, the avenues we might travel to engage in that prayer. And the very back of the book is actually the longest chapter of the book, and it talks about that petitionary type of prayer. And we shouldn't be surprised, should we, that St. Augustine would have many of those? Oh, of course. I mean, you know, Jesus told us to ask for our daily bread. Even though God knows what we need before we ask, St. Augustine says that when you pray, it makes you ready to receive God's blessings. It's for your benefit, not God's. And it also establishes the relationship between you and God that, like a child, and you really relate to God like a heavenly father, that you're not afraid to ask for what you need. And you can ask for that those things which, of your blindness, you don't know to ask. But you're right, the petitionary prayers are beautiful, too. I always love that section. Almost all of his prayers included a little bit of petition, like, He prayed to be cleansed from sin and to be freed from anger and armed with patience, drive out the enemy from my deeds and thoughts, and he hungers and thirsts for truth. That's, of course, my favorite. One of the things I like about the prayers that I'm not sure everyone would identify with, some might, is that he understands somehow deep down the paradoxical nature of God. For example, how Jesus could be a tiny infant 
nursing with his mother, yet he's feeding her at the same time with his truths. I mean, those are deep thoughts. If you really want to sit with this book and read one of those prayers, it, it's just something beautiful to meditate on and let the Lord speak to your heart about those deep truths. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions, which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking to Sarah Park McLaughlin about her book, Praying with St. Augustine. That's, I think, important, taking on that type of spiritual reading that at once is spiritual and it can be instructive, help catechize us and draw us deeper in the faith, which I think this one does, but it also becomes a source of devotion. It's a devotional, so you don't have to rush through everything and say, okay, I read that, boom, it's on the shelf and, and it's gone. This can accompany you through many, many years, maybe even a lifetime. I hope people will keep it by their bedside and read. That's what I wanted it for originally, and I'm using it for that purpose at night. I pray a few of those prayers to begin my own personal prayers. And one of my friends, it's funny you said that, has a doctorate in theology. She's one of my best friends, and so I sent her a copy a while back, and she said, it's going to take me a long time. She said, I, I can't zip through it. I want to review it. But she said, it's going to take a while because uh, these prayers are so moving and inspirational. I want to pray them as I go through. So I'm not going to rush at all, which made me feel really good because that's what I had hoped and intended that the book would be is a devotional guide for anyone who, the beginner who doesn't know anything about prayer, maybe for Catholics and Protestants alike. I also have a good friend who's an evangelical Presbyterian, and she reviewed the book and said it was a profound revelation to her because she only knew a couple of quotes from St. Augustine and had no idea that his prayers spoke so deeply to the truths that all Christians share. So that was a nice uh, revelation for her. I always wonder why we haven't called him uh, St. Augustine the Great. Uh, <laughs> We've had other greats, Gregory the Great and Leo the Great, and they were great. But there's something about St. Augustine that touches, again, that penetrates our innermost being with his wonderful humanity that's seeking out his salvation. 
And I think that section that you have on prayers of forgiveness and salvation, I think is a must contemplation, as it were, a meditation for all of us to take a chance with those and just really spend some time with those particular prayers as well. Well, certainly the book has a lot of variety in it. There's there's a prayer for every occasion. And, you know, what's interesting is he didn't have a method in the same way St. Ignatius and some of the other saints did, but he just spoke from the heart. He incorporates a lot of scriptures, which is also very interesting and moving. And he had a tremendous knowledge of scripture. So his prayers are often laced with scripture, with cries directly to God, with just such depth and eloquence. Very few prayers that I've ever seen, and I've, I've read a lot of prayer books, have the breadth and depth that his prayers do. You know, one thing about him as a person that I think is moving, I read that when he was dying, he had the monk copy by hand all the penitential psalms from the Bible on huge, huge, huge sheets of paper or whatever they had and put them all around his cell so that he could read and pray the penitential psalms over and over and over until he died. Now, that's really a profound tribute to him. Wow, profound. It's so remarkable that here is the saint that for the church in its liturgy, the hours we encounter, I think maybe more than any other in the office of readings. I mean, he continues to guide us in his instruction. I don't want to say daily, but it's at least weekly you're going to encounter St. Augustine in that great liturgy of the church. I think he should be called St. Augustine the Great. I'm still (laughs) mulling over what you said, and that's an interesting question. He, He just, he pops up everywhere. One of the things that I studied long ago was uh, the first book I ever read by him was The City of God, which is not a lot of people's favorites. It's, it's a little bit dense, but it really, really opens your eyes to the difference between the earthly city, which is the people that are just kind of, we would say now, of the world, and those that are moving toward the city of God or heaven. We're all commingled on earth, and it's a fabulous book. Well, anyway, and then I read the Confessions, which is, it, it's not a juicy scandal. It's really, he meant by Confessions, his crying out to God and the story of his conversion and that sort of thing. But his books are just beautiful. He speaks to everybody that there's just something for everyone, which is what's so astonishing. And of course, his sermons, he, he knew how to preach to the common person because he was a, a bishop and he knew how to touch hearts. He knew how to speak directly to the heart. That's why I think the the work that you've done with this particular book, Praying with St. Augustine, is so important because you did go through all the, that source material. You went through those sermons. You went through the, those books. And as I said earlier, you listened carefully and you pulled out those areas that really were the prayers of his heart. And you compiled that for us. And you can't find this in any other publication. If I'm not mistaken, this has not been available before. So it's a tremendous resource, Sarah. Only in the past, in the 90s and some other times, there have been some books that were Prayers of St. Augustine, but they were kind of short-lived. You know how things kind of come and go, and in the publishing world, things don't always stay in print for a long time. So I think the timing is just right now, we need a fresh volume, and we needed a fairly comprehensive one. I mean, there's no way to to collect all his prayers. And I will say, some of his prayers you will see like on a website or something that'll say, Prayer from St. Augustine. And unless we could really find the source and nail it down, because we did put all the sources of all these prayers, we couldn't include it in the book. And so there's no telling how many prayers there are of his you know, circulating around, but the ones that we can really be positive that showed up in print have been included in everything I could find. I I looked through his soliloquies, many, many books that, like you say, people probably wouldn't have sitting on their coffee table. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the prayers are from the Confessions, and that's one of his more well-known books. The thing is, the bibliography in the book is also priceless because you can point people into 
a direction they can follow to obtain these wonderful works and where to find not only these prayers, but what was being given by him prior to him just exploding with this communication. A lot of the prayers of St. Augustine really, they really reveal the truth of Scripture to us. They're, They're reinforced by his prayer. That's one of the things, you're right, the bibliography can point you to the original sources, but in addition to that, the scriptures that he includes, you could almost do an entire book on just scriptural references by St. Augustine because it would lead you on most fascinating study of the Bible. You could sit with this book and look at some of the scriptures that he cites and then go to the Bible and read those passages and let God speak to your heart reveal the truth of the scripture to you in the same way he did to St. Augustine. You know, St. Augustine even wrote a rule for monks, a rule that they followed, and he said in there, when you pray to God in psalms and hymns, let the heart ponder what the mouth utters. So that really, I think, is a profound thought. Let the heart ponder what the mouth utters. We may sometimes fall in, I don't, I know I do, kind of fall into a habit of reciting, you know, rattling off the well-known prayers, and those are beautiful in the church, but sometimes the familiarity with them leads us to kind of glaze over. I don't know if you ever do that, but sometimes my mind wanders, and St. Augustine's prayers kind of bring a new, fresh insight into prayer, so we're reading prayers that we're not familiar with, and we're really seeing and hearing what God has to say through those prayers to us. Oh, Sarah, I have just been thrilled to be able to talk to you about praying with St. Augustine. The minute I got it in my hand, I just went, whoa. And then I started reading it, and I went, wow, because it really meets the current need that we have. And to be guided by this absolutely phenomenal father and doctor of the church, the great heart and soul of St. Augustine, who still reaches out to us today, in particular, through your work right now. So I'm so grateful. I wish we had more time. Any final thoughts? Just want people to realize that anybody can benefit from the book. You don't have to be a scholar or familiar with St. Augustine. You don't even have to know who he is. The prayers are, they just speak profoundly to your heart. And anyone who prays these prayers from the heart will be changed in the heart. And that's uh, what Peter Kreft said in his foreword. So take a look at it and see what God has in store for you individually, praying with St. Augustine. I'm so glad that you put this together. Dr. Crave also said it's worth learning Latin just to read St. Augustine. But hey, we don't have to, to learn Latin all over again because you've done the work for us. You brought us the great writings and the beautiful prayers of St. Augustine. So we're so grateful. Thank you so very much, Sarah. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the time and speaking to you on your program today. God bless. With Sarah Park McLaughlin, we've gone inside the pages of Praying with St. Augustine. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to sophiainstitute.com the website for its publisher, Sophia Institute, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or wherever you download your podcasts. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this program has been helpful for you, that you will First, pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, Insights from Today's Most Compelling Authors.